pleasure to chair uh, this session. And of course I have to tell you something about Dick. Uh, I was in Santa Barbara at the time when the, the gang of CDMers descended. And I was a very young and naive theoretical physicist. I'm now very old and naive but um, we really believe we're going to learn something about fundamental physics uh, from this field. And so that was a very exciting uh, age, a very exciting workshop to be at. Um, and, uh, and I think we've continued to interact ever since. I've never had the fortune to write a paper with Dick, but he's definitely influenced uh, many of the papers we did, uh, we did write about cosmic strings and so on. And I guess what impressed me most about Dick is that he he's always really interested in, even in the way out ideas of the type I uh, investigate. And, um, and he's quite sincere about that. And so whereas with uh, typical astronomers or astrophysicists, well, he's smirking, really. Typically, with astrophysicists and astronomers, you know they wonder why we sort of alien species uh, of uh, particle physicists slash string theorists are so naive as to believe we'll actually learn something fundamental from this field. Um, but Dick uh, certainly not one of those. Uh, he, he does believe in the long term and uh, the big ideas. So um, I must admit, uh, all of the successes of Dick and his colleagues in the standard paradigm, I mean, each one of these successes was uh, deeply disappointing <laughs> to us. <laughs> early 90s, I myself got sucked into this and started doing the same old boring uh, <laughs> calculations of linear perturbation growth and CMB and all that. And, and, and our calculations too were successful, and that was even more disappointing <laughs> because... Uh, what? <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> it was still disappointing. Um, but uh, nevertheless, we live in hope, and uh, I think the foundations have been laid for an incredibly exciting field, and I still believe that somebody one day is going to discover something truly fundamental in this subject. And on that note, I'll hand over to Jess about gastrophysics. Okay, well, um, <laughs> notice the theorist on that first slide has a, a, many hands. So this is clearly what one needs to do theory. Uh, it helps you with hand wiggling. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, maybe we'll evolve into that someday. <clears throat> Let, let's um, begin. Um, okay, so I um, did my, my homework. And um, here is the very impressive citation history of Dick. And I did an empirical correction here. Um, my, my bit of forecasting for the year. <laughs> so you can see it's, a, you know, it's very, very, very steady, very impressive, and continues to, to rise. And, uh, so uh, congratulations on that. And so, and then I, I did a little more research on, on a more general theme type astrophysics as words we have around us. And let me show you what I came up with. There's a wonderful article um, by Freeman Dyson called Birds and Frogs. Now, in this article, it's written about mathematicians that provides equally well astrophysics. It says that some are birds, some are frogs. The birds are those who can see far. Uh, they have broad vistas to the far horizon. They delight in concepts that unify their feet, etc. Whereas frogs live in the mud below, <laughs> you can see only the flowers that grow nearby. They delight in the details of the objects, and they solve problems one at a time. Okay, so I, I want you to contemplate are you a bird or a frog? <laughs> now, in trying to classify Dick, it was very difficult. 
<laughs> uh, because he had aspects of a bird and aspects of a frog. However, <laughs> uh, I, I finally decided on the bird. And so then I set about trying to um, find a suitable bird. And let me show you the results of that research. <laughs> and so, from the moon.
Okay, so let's first of all consider um, star formation in this galaxy and the basic units of giant molecular clouds. Um, clouds, and we know um, empirically that the efficiency of star formation, defined in various ways that either don't matter, it's roughly 2% um, of that gas mass turns into stars. Um, that sort of local star formation, if it were 100% would be a disaster, we have 50 times too much star formation, and so it's self-control by OB stars. The outflows from OB stars, the winds, etc., and the experience, which disrupt the clouds. On the galactic scale, it's those same massive stars that control the efficiency, but now the dominant role is probably more by supernova explosions that account for the turbulence in the uh, interstellar medium, and that again uh, maintains uh, the star formation at a reasonably low value. And you can sort of estimate what this is from the known energy of supernova compared to velocity of the star snow value, um, standard calculation. So again, it's about 2% efficiency for star formation globally in the galaxy. It's sort of a coincidence, but it, it goes a long way towards explaining one of the most used laws in astronomy, um, in critical laws, which is the schmidt kennecke law. So the schmidt kennecke law is the relation between uh, star formation rate and gas surface density. And um, what is, uh, uh, as the line that's plotted through the points, um, is this very simple line. It's gas surface density over the variable time scale, rotation time, essentially, um, at time of an efficiency factor, telling you the fraction of the gas which goes to the stars. And again, it's 0.02. Meaning a galaxy can re rotate 50 times before it uses up most of its gas. And that essentially is like this galaxy long lived, and stars have a long time scale. Now, this comes from instability theory, um, the formation of clouds, um, you know, gas rich disk. Um, but the disk has to be cold, for the coldness to make it unstable and eventually lead to cloud agglomeration, cloud fragmentation, etc. And, and that is partly due to um, uh, accretion of cold gas. Um, as, and the efficiency is kept low, again globally, by, by feedback. And on this gravel plot, nearby galaxies, even if star forming complexes in N51, or more or less fit that law. And you can see the other, the, the cold gas accretion, there's ample evidence for that when you look at um, nearby star forming galaxies, lots of gas around to fall in. Here's on the same scale, the other optical and 21 centimeter image showing you a vast reservoir of gas. So the gas are kept cold, kept unstable. And the details then of how they form into stars um, uh, is the microscopic physics, which we really have yet to understand in detail. Now, the same physics can be studied at high redshift. So here, for example, now going towards redshift 2, and you see the local galaxies <coughs> uh, are plotted you know, over uh, here, on the stuff, and we get normal galaxies, or in, or in this curve as well. But when you go to extreme objects, the extreme starbursts, you find, if anything, that are slightly higher on this diagram. What that means is the efficiency of star formation is slightly higher maybe in extreme objects. But generally speaking, everything makes stars are roughly two percent. Lines parallel to this are constant star formation efficiency. The line that goes through these points is two and a half percent. So this is sort of data on atomic molecular gas um, in star formation rates. Okay, um, so I would say that on a global scale, we sort of <coughs> understand the efficiency of star formation. But um, that's good. What is not so good is when we try to put this together to understand the luminosity function of galaxies. So here we have a comparison of theory and observation. And so theory, basically fresh jet type theory, gives you the mass <coughs> function, the luminosity function equivalently, so conversion of mass to light, and the observational data is the luminosity function, let's say the chapter function. I'll show you in more detail in on the second. And you notice that when I, when I normalize for some appropriate mass to light ratio, I get a wonderful fit of one point. Okay, so things are a disaster at the two ends. Now, it does so happen that this one point is nicely explained by theory. Because you go through simple cooling arguments, okay, that was done a long time ago, comparing the cooling time with the free fall time, and you find that that condition you can rewrite into a critical mass. Um, with the two time scales over there, and a simple function for, of the cooling function, which is nearly constant, 
And it turns out the only parameter in this, which you can't see, is called the gravitational wave structure constant. So basically, we find this critical mass, which is a fundamental constant, um, turns out to be roughly the right luminosity or mass for an LSL galaxy. That's great. OK, what do you do about the two ends? Well, this is where the complex gastrophysics come, come, comes in. First of all, on low mass scales, we appeal um, in not, not much of this range to blind the gas out. Some of the stars go to supernova, and so galaxies with rotation losses of 20, 30, 40 times a second, but the gas is expelled before most of the gas turns into stars. Um, and on massive, <coughs> not massive galaxies, Venture wasn't too deep to do this, and so here we appeal to feedback from black hole outflows to blow the gas out. And so these two uh, types of feedback then are intrinsic to essentially all modern studies <coughs> of the luminosity function. Here we have the gap to luminosity function from recent data, and you can see that um, it stays relatively flat um, compared to the theory, which you have to modify with your feedback. And uh, at the massive end, you can get things to work more or less, again, with appropriate feedback from the black holes. OK, so how well should we believe any of this? Well, um, I find it very encouraging what's now being found way over here somewhere for the extreme low North galaxy. You saw some of this in Carlos's talk already. Uh, we discovered this whole new generation of ultra faint dwarf galaxies, which pretty much are what you expect if supernova feedback plus the very smallest objects, the effects of ionization, um, which are one of the most lowest potential worlds, um, come in and clean up the low mass end. So this is a comparison of the data to uh, FIPS from, from recent situations. <coughs> so things things are really good. What is, what's harder to see on this graph is over here, there are two points that lie out, out, out of this. They're, they're the mass like clouds. And um, explaining those simultaneously with these is not Immediately obvious, because if you explain those, you know, things will work over here. But basically, for the new objects, they seem to be what was predicted by the theory, pretty much. OK. Um, so, and then a higher end shift. Here's another interesting surprise. We're, we're measuring now in the deepest images taken with the Space Telescope, with the new camera, um, this continuing rise in the number of objects beyond range of four to very low luminosities. Pretty much the same slope the theory predicts you know, within, within, within the others. Uh, so we can even go slowly to range of 10 to see it's So that, that, that suggests that you know, early on, these dwarfs were in place undergoing their initial star formation, and then today <coughs> they become more, more or less invisible for whatever reason. OK. Um, so that's what I want to tell you about gastrophysics or in the disk galaxies. Now, let me move to the spheroidal galaxies, the little <coughs> large bulges, bulges. So here, the problem that we have is that, you know, that there'll be too many of them, the gas that calls it does cool. How do we get this nearly exponential cutoff that we observe in the luminous function? And so that's connected to another problem. It turns out that if one then, as you heard from me, <coughs> appeals to feedback, Here's a black hole growing in the center. There's a, an accretion disk around it, eventually drives an outflow, which sweeps out much of the gas, forming stars at roughly the same time. Uh, let's suppose it's blowing out radiation at the end of the radiation that was moving with the gas. Then when the black hole becomes big enough, it will clear out the gas. Remarkably, when you can here, the ending luminosity, this is black hole mass, to the self-gravity, which goes basically the signal to the fourth, to the roll squared, you can set that equal, you get the equation, m goes to sigma to the fourth. And the amazing thing is that roughly um, this momentum balance equation um, more or less fits the data. Okay? And the normalization approximately too. Okay, so that suggests that you know an indicator of feedback in massive galaxies may be the black hole mass signal relation. Okay. So it turns out that this is maybe not as clean of a test as one would like. Because I'm looking into this a little more carefully, um, there may not be quite enough momentum available. So this is another way, this is taking the actual data and plotting the momentum available in the radiation outflows um, versus uh, the black hole mass and using um, uh, the, the, the gas mass as a, as, a, as a proxy for the mass of the bubble. And you can see one simply does not have quite enough momentum. Um, 
by a factor of a few. So it looks as though this may not work. Now you may be skeptical, there are assumptions that go into this, but let me show you another way of looking at this problem which demonstrates the same problem. So here's a steroidal galaxy and a disk galaxy. And let's ask, what is the baryon fraction in these two galaxies? If, if, if the massive black hole outflows are driving the baryons up, this should have fewer baryons per the primordial fraction of this. Well, unfortunately, that's just not what we find. If I compare these two galaxies, if anything, this galaxy has more baryons than, than the other one. OK. Um, so this suggests that black holes per se are not, cannot explain the feedback, which is separate. <coughs> well, as a good uh, gastrophysical theorist, one has to go back to the drawing board and, and then um, come up with something new. Well, the obvious thing is it's not supernova. It's not active at the nuclear depth, it must be both. So the next possibility is let's, you know, um, let's try and see both of them. So how does that work? Okay, so in fact, it turns out that AGN luminosities are very closely correlated with star bursts and star formation luminosities. You can separate the two because there are typical features in the infrared spectra that signify star formation using PAH features. And there are power law continuum that typically symbolize the role of the um, AGN. And this is the correlation over a wide range of scales between star formation rate and volumetric luminosity, uh, including AGN activity, I say at the higher end. And it's pretty good. <coughs> connection between the two. And if you look at the newest data, which takes this to higher energy, from Herschel, just released the other day, actually. Here is the accretion luminosity that's inferred from the far infrared spectrum against starburst luminosity. And you can see, going to high redshift, <coughs> lots of scatter, but there's a general trend connecting the two. So when you have one, you have the other. That doesn't tell you about, you know, which is, which is driving which. It's clear that, you know, the gas um, that feeds the star formation will also feed the black hole in the center, but you know, it's a small fraction of the total gas, and is there some causal relation that connects the two? So let me argue, um, and this maybe is pushing astrophysics to its extremes, is that there is. Uh, imagine a radio lobe over here somewhere, uh, driven by a jet, I'm expanding, here's an interstellar cloud, um, and what's going to happen? Well, the more diffuse gas, the clouds will be disrupted, and will blown out, but the more compact clouds will be compressed and will undergo star formation. And because the travel time for this is shorter um, than the dynamical time for the galaxy, we're going to have star formation in a more coherent way. It's, one more, it's going to be enhanced by basically the ratio of, of, of the time scales. Um, and in fact, if you want to do this a little more <coughs> precisely, you have to use the pressure, okay? Because star formation rate depends on the ambient pressure, so some theorists say at least. And in fact, that gives you an amplification factor because it's the square root of pressure that goes to the star rate that turns out to be all around you. Anyway, that's the star formation rate. You can see roughly why it's boosting because things happen more quickly than the simple gravitational dynamical time. And also, the momentum will be amplified from the AGN by the effects of the supernova. So I get a double effect going on. Okay, again, that's, um, that, that's sort of. Uh, I won't even try to quantify that for you. Again, it's all the magnitude effect, roughly, so one does the calculation there. But I just want you to look at one example here. This is Minkowski's object. Okay? This is one case where we're pretty sure trivia is going on. And it's a very nice case. Here you have radio contours, you have galaxy observations, with a pixelated analysis showing you aging of stellar populations. And what's clear is you're squeezing and driving star formation as this radio jet interacts with this uh, gas rich uh, neighboring cloud. Okay, so things pretty much, I think, um, are on track there for a complicated explanation of what ought to be rather simple. Okay, so now let me then tell you what the consequences of this might be. So, I would suggest there are two types of star formation, one without AGN and one with the effects of AGN and supermassive electrons. So, where does this get you? Well, it's interesting that there's an analogy here, because we know um, that there are two types of gas of which are important. One are the effect of the cosmic web, which would be cold streams, and these streams may contain enormous clumps. We call these minor mergers typically, or streaming flows, they're the same thing, 
all the major mergers, which are much more massive things, are the cooling flows in the centers of massive payloads, involving much more risk. And the major merger will concentrate the gas and not drive it into the center. So a more dramatic and more efficient effect, perhaps, and this will both occur. Okay, and we have proponents of both. Okay, so here are our simulations of, of, uh, of, of cooling flows, provided by, by, by Abishai. And um, you can see three long streams with high resolution, they're very strongly coming in. And here we have um, an example of a simulation of, an age, of a major merger leading to very dramatic star formation. Okay, so both, and, and mergers of course are very important at high rate shift. And so uh, maybe the, the cooling and gas equation comes in at low rate shift, you might expect that. So what do we say about, about putting this into the cosmic context? Um, let me try to, before I do that, I just, I, let me just make one comment in reverse. That, that what none of these theories can explain is the fact that 16% of disks are completely thin on their side of the bubble. This is one of our biggest challenges to understand that. I don't think it's been understood here. Anyway, so what can we say about the major mergers? So it's interesting, if you look at the star formation history, you can divide that up into normal galaxies and the extremely luminous infrared galaxies, which are major mergers. So here are the star forming galaxies, which are one, and these come in at higher rate of two and beyond. And the merger fraction is large, but <coughs> the merger mergers. So mergers are certainly happening in the early universe. Okay, so um, let me show you one more fascinating piece of evidence, again from the recent data. This is the star formation rate, the, in, the inverse of the star formation time scale, the specific star formation rate, that is star formation rate over, 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 over stellar night, and both of which are measured. And you can see that that low redshift gives you this equivalent number, which we of a, a order, you know, um, uh, giga years, which we infer for the local galaxies. But when you get to high redshift beyond roughly two, it, it's significantly faster, roughly half a giga year. Okay? Suggesting again, you know, maybe there are two modes of star formation: one rather inefficient and slow, and one much more intense and you know, as a mixture of the two at different redshifts. Okay, so what can we say about that? Uh, again, here's another intriguing hint from the distant universe. So here we have redshift six quasars, by the way, redshift five quasars. This is infrared star formation versus CO, a proxy for gas. <coughs> now, we all know that CO is actually excited differently in extreme objects. So the true gas mass is going to be lower for these objects. There's these objects where we plot this little gas mass over here. Here's the usual low redshift shoot so which depends on equivalent. So this again tells you that one has very efficient star formation in objects that fit in this universe, maybe more directly than the previous. And that's one example. Here's another example where um, Comedy and Tremaine have tried to divide up the galaxies on the black hole signal relation between those with true bulges, big bulges, and those with so-called pseudo bulges, which basically are formed through the disk second stabilities, and therefore may, may involve a different mode of star formation from that occurring for the massive bulges. And it's interesting, there is an offset between the two. And so, and again, the suggestion is that true bulges lie high, the pseudo bulges might uh, are more easily explained, and here you might, by, by conventional star formation perhaps, he might need something more efficient with this diagram to explain the bulge. Okay, perhaps. Okay, it's an intriguing hit. Um, okay, so um, one more um, example um, is this. Um, if I now go to, again, a high rate of universe, we're able to measure um, dynamical masses for CO clouds, the host galaxy, the high rate of quasars. And again, this is the black hole mass stellar bulge relation. And again, things lie very high. So all this is suggestive that you know maybe star formation gets even more extreme as I go to these very high red charts. Okay, so let me try to uh, put the galaxy formation uh, part of the talk in, in context. Um, and it goes something like this. Um, I think that um, you know, when there's a low efficiency mode of star formation, dominant disks with supernova feedback playing a role, cold gas flow, flows and minor mergers will form these things. A high rate shift is a different story. And there we have major mergers, and the efficiency most likely is much higher, and form stars more efficiently. 
Um, black holes play a role both in quenching star formation, uh, maybe in heating the, the galaxy clusters, but possibly in triggering and giving you this extra boost by the by something. And as to the formation of black holes, we don't really know very much. Okay, so in the last three minutes, um, let me um, give you gastrophysics and star formation. Okay, so yet one more example of the complexity of the field, and the fact that ultimately we don't really know that much. So the hero in this field was Eddington, who made, without knowing anything about nuclear reactions, he understood stars, and made the remarkable observation that a physicist living on a cloud-bound planet could predict that there had to be stars. And he did that from the theory of self-gravity polytropic gas fields. Okay. Realized that it went massive enough that you may use one space. Okay, what happens is the stars. So that was sort of amazing. Um, and of course, um, genes then added to this with ideas about fragmentation. And so let me then summarize the genes fragmentation, which is the key of star formation. So if I take fragmentation theory, which says that the genes mass, which depends on temperature and density roughly this way, okay, when the cloud is isothermal, the genes mass gets smaller and smaller. That's the mass inside a region where the sound wave crossing time um, is equal to free fall time. Beyond that, gravity dominates, well, the, the pressure dominates, the critical mass. So isothermal collapse, fragmentation. But there comes a point when the mass is important and the fragment mass is gone. Okay? That gives you a minimum fragmentation scale. Now, essentially, back at the envelope, and all numerical simulations come up with the same number. Okay? 0.01 solar masses, which you can understand as the minus three half power of the gravitational mass of cluster. That's what it roughly is. You can relate the mass of any star to this plus other constant. Okay? It's fundamental. So you have a fundamental prediction of the fragmentation scale. But we know it's the wrong answer. Okay? It's not a star. So what happens? Well, what happens is accretion. Okay? So gas accretes onto the star. And we do know roughly what the accretion rate is in a fairly generic situation, so gravity sphere that's um, uh, rising isothermal, it sounds being cubed up a G. Now, if I apply this accretion rate to today's stars in low temperatures and molecular bounds, I find it's about a millionth of a solar mass a year, 10 Kelvin, which means that over a million years I've accreted solar mass roughly, and that's roughly when Kelvin Helmholtz kicks in the progress of the So I can make solar mass stars, but if I do this in the early universe, when I have no heavy elements, right, the temperature is roughly 1,000 kilometers. That's because all I have is the molecular hydrogen cooling. And then, instead, I get 10 minus 3 solar mass a year, which means over um, 100,000 years, say, the minimum time of anything much to happen with the feedback from the star, I have 100,000 solar masses. Therefore, the first stars are massive. So again, these are two rather robust results, which again explain essentially all modern simulations. <coughs> Um, and, um, but even that's not the entire answer, because why aren't all stars massive? The answer, you know, one solar mass or more, and the answer is feedback comes in as well. There are outflows from young forming stars, pre main sequence stars, evident in the holes you see in this molecular cloud, and that stops, and that's basically due to the coupling of energy to the and stellar energy. And again, there are beautiful simulations of this, I'll show you one example. Bell and collaborators. So you imagine two towering stars in this old, old, old model, but done um, beautiful simulations, in which blow winds, um, which stop mass fall again, and then when the winds die out, the mass comes in again. So you have sort of a cycle. And in this example, mag magnetism is critical because otherwise the jets would just punch their way out. And in fact, you get lots of um, stirring up of the clouds, and he's able to explain the low efficiency of star forming clouds and um, the turbulence in clouds with um, uh, outflows from, from young stars. <coughs> so that, those are examples then of, of, of the complexity of, uh, of gastrophysics. Okay, so um, let me now end uh, with uh, wishing you a good day. So thank you. I believe uh, that uh, uh, you simplified the attention and the role of magnetic fields in this. <laughs> 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 in this case,
case I will not follow. All I wanted to make the point was that when Bell and Company did their simulations of outfields, they were not getting feedback when they put in the fields from the outflows to make the dramatic difference. <laughs> but of course, uh, the issue that I mentioned earlier about the coupling of stellar energy, gravitational energy release to the fields is very, very complex for the feedback from driving those outflows themselves. I couldn't begin to go into that in this talk. Yeah, it's also this issue that uh, uh, this, uh, uh, if we are talking about uh, fragmentation and collapse, in, uh, if we are uh, appealing uh, uh, to the uh, uh, moving system of reference. In this uh, case, uh, this uh, moving uh, clumps can collapse if they are not magnetized. But uh, there is no system of reference where we have uh, zero magnetic field. Um. Well, they could be in the primordial case. No, no, I'm not okay. speaking okay. about yes, yes, yes. But, in, but you know, but then it depends on the strength of the field, whether the magnetic field softens the collisions and merges between clumps or not, totally open question. So there are issues like that, I think, in the world. Well, you focused on the low density cocoons that are produced by the, uh, by the radio jets, but, but a lot of um, outflow energy from growing black holes may come from fairly dense uh, uh, disk winds, for example, in broad absorption line yes. quasars. Uh, you thought a bit about how those might come to the uh, surrounding medium. What are their differences? I, I would imagine that you know they would interact closely. That the effects like quantum coupling, close in, etc. But something is going to get out. We see stuff get out. So um, the energy energy is there. Exactly the details of how it gets out. I think is totally open. This is again somewhere that one needs far better understanding by a simulation problem. Do you expect that if, if, if a bunch of stars are formed from the crush in the jet and they must have leaving, do you expect the stars to have any features, magnetic features, about the external uh, day? Right, so that's an issue question. Um, presumably, uh, in the example I, go, I gave, there is going to be some, as well as overpressuring, there's going to be some push given to that star cluster when eventually forms. So that would leave a trace behind, activity. I suppose if that happened in, in the inner part of our galaxy early on, one might expect kinematic you know, effects resulting from that mode of star formation. You would not see in the normal mode. Can you make hypervelocity? Sorry? Can you make hypervelocity? I have not thought about it. Okay, there are no more questions. Let's thank Joe again. <laughs>